Hello, welcome to the Growing Design Podcast, where we help you grow your design agency. If you want to learn how to price your services, how to sell your expertise, and how to attract the right type of clients, you've come to the right place. I'm your host, Ed Orozco. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Growing Design. If you're in the tech and design world or have been for a while, well, today's guest is, doesn't need any introduction. He's written extensively about design, usability, um, human-computer interaction. He's the founder of Center Center, um, which is uh, an organization for uh, design education. Uh, he's a speaker at conferences. Um, before COVID, he used to speak at many conferences in person um, all over the world, all the time. And he's also the, uh, the host of a community, an online community called Leaders of Awesomeness. And uh, he's going to tell us more about that later. But without further delay, um, today's host is Jared Spool. Jared, do you want mind introducing yourself a little bit for those who okay. don't know you? Uh, I'm Jared Spool. I, all those things you said are true. I, I don't know how to add to it. <laughs> Great. I didn't... I didn't um, Make any mistakes yeah. there? Yeah, yeah, no. All correct? You know, you know gold medal winner, you know, uh, red carpet, <laughs> uh, celebrity, that sort of thing. I, I missed <laughs> those. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It, you know, it's it, there's so much. Yeah. Yeah, so much indeed. Um, so where to begin when there's so much? But, you know, the beginning. Let's start from the beginning. So you've been doing usability before usability was a thing before ux was um even a thing i think the co the term wasn't coined until like the 90s or something right um, so how did you get into usability and what did things look like back then in terms of you know technology was different probably the mentality of people was different so can you tell us a little bit about the beginnings well um it wasn't even called usability when I started. Um, it was, it had all sorts of funny names, uh, human computer interaction, software, human factors, man, machine interfaces there. Nobody could agree. They all were pretty awful. Um, uh, the, the, when I started, you know, people ask me, you know, how did I, become a UX person. And I, I didn't ever really. Um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sort of like you go to a, uh, an empty secluded beach and you put out your blanket and you curl up with a good book and you just start reading. And uh, uh, you look up a few hours later and now the beach is completely filled with people. Um, and there are, you know, they've all discovered the same beach and, and it's like, that's sort of how my career has been. I, and when I got here, there were hardly anybody here. And, and, and then I looked up and like, Oh my gosh, we've got 23,000 people in the leaders of awesomeness community. I'm like, where did all these people come from? <laughs> so it's, it's, it, and I really don't have an explanation for it. I mean, I don't, um, it's always just, I, I was always very interested in, making things work for people. I was a software developer creating the first generation of, of software for personal computers. You know, what we now think of as word processors and uh, voice communications and um, spreadsheets and things like that. I, um, uh, those things didn't exist when I started and I worked on the first ones and, and, in the process of, of, you know, building the first email client for a PC, um, I came to, to, to realize that, that the work we did could either be really hard to use or really easy to use. And we had to figure out how to consistently make it easy to use because it felt like we only knew how to consistently make it hard to use. So, so I just started focusing on that and started hanging around other people who were interested in the same topic. And the next thing you know, there's an industry. But of course that didn't happen overnight. 
No, no, it didn't happen overnight. That took about 40 years or so. So it, it you know, I, I first started thinking about it in 81. So we're, we're definitely 40 years into this. Was there, um, was there a moment where you sort of like realized or like stopped and realized, oh, wow, there's a lot of people doing design for software right now? Um, I guess it means it depends what you mean by design for software. There are a lot of people making software, um, and that number just kept growing. Um, you know, the, the, when I started the number of companies making software for computers, you could, you could count. Um, uh, and Organizations had large IT departments, but they were they were building large mainframe apps that only that 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 end users wouldn't use for the most part, or people who did use would go through lots and lots of training. So it it was the case that um that that people were were uh building things with the expectation that whatever you built, people would learn how to use if it, if it did what it needed to do. And so they were very much focused on meeting the business goals and meeting the, the technology requirements and leaving it at that. And that's basically what it was. Did any of these um, mainframes and sort of like, yeah, the computers back then, did, did all of them have graphical interfaces? Mm. Did that come no, no, no. They were all character based. There was no, there were, at the time, there were very, very expensive graphic displays. I mean, these were, these were, these weren't computers. They were just the screen and keyboard and usually some sort of light pen or something like that. And they cost uh, 10 times what it cost to get a non graphical display. So you could get 10 character-based displays, what were called dumb terminals at the time. Uh, you could get 10 of those, or you could get uh, uh, one of these graphical-based things. So you only, you only got the graphic things when you, you really um, uh, needed it. But the personal computer revolution basically changed that because one of the things that made personal computers appealing was that was that they could do graphics, though they would do them in this sort of awkward way. You had to turn off the character display and you got a lower resolution screen when you went to graphics. So even then it was costly to do anything graphical. Um, and there were no graphic CPUs, right? There are no graphic processors. So, so any manipulation of the graphics had to be done by the main CPU. So that meant that anything you were doing, you had to stop doing and, and, and display pixels on the screen. I remember writing a word processor and coming up with an efficient word wrap algorithm, right? So the word processors, the first generation of word processors only would let you edit on the bottom line of the screen, like a typewriter, right? You could, you could see everything above it, but you couldn't see anything below it. And the reason for that was that it was incredibly uh, processor intensive to word wrap, to figure out that you just typed a character and that pushed the word down to the next line, which pushes the word at the end of that line down to the next line, which pushes the word to that, right? And to manipulate all those words and to do that um, uh, was computationally expensive. And you couldn't, you couldn't, you literally couldn't keep up with somebody's typing and word wrap at the same time. So, so they, they had this hack on these word processors. We, the, they, uh, uh, the word, the word, if you typed in the middle of a sentence, it would just disappear off the end and you wouldn't, you would never know where it went. It just, it just vanished. Right. And, uh, and even that was slow. But you could do it, and you could keep up with most fast typists. Though so we would do things like 
go to what were at the time called typing centers or typing pools. And we would find the fastest typist who could type at 130, 135 words per minute. And we would put our systems in front of them and watch the systems utterly die because they'd get two paragraphs in and it was still working on the first paragraph. And, and so, so a lot of my work in the early days was figuring out the fastest way to detect a key, figure out what pixels they had to be on the screen, put those pixels on the screen, wrap the text, and do that all in real time. And then going to this uh, typist, that was the user testing of these systems. We're trying right. to figure out. Right, right. right. So, so, so um, we don't call it user testing. If, if, you, if you honor anything uh, uh, close to a dying breath, uh, never call it user testing again. It's usability testing. We're not testing the users. We're testing the design. But yes, that's exactly what we were doing was, was we, were, we were doing the first usability testing that anybody had ever done. Um, uh, we were making it all up. Many of the things that you do in usability testing today came out of the work that we were doing back in the 80s. Uh, and I was in the very first usability testing lab that was ever built uh, for software um, uh, and, and uh, helped build it and run it. And uh, it was an old air conditioning closet and it was still in use. There was this, the back wall was a giant air conditioner that can, that, that, that chilled the air for the entire fifth floor of this half mile long building in Maynard, Massachusetts, an old mill building. And uh, every time we ran a usability test, we had to turn off the air conditioning for the entire floor, which just pissed everybody off. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, and we had these old uh, Sony Betamax video cassette recorders that we recorded the sessions on, and these giant cameras that that uh, um, I mean they were this long, and they were mounted on the wall. And if you were lucky, you had one that was motor controlled, and you could reset it from in the lab without having to go into the participant room and 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 move the camera so that they were in view. Um, and they had motors on them that were very noisy. So every time you move the camera, the participant would look up and stare into the camera um, because it just made noise, and and you you could tell that it was uh, that it was there. So yeah, this this was the early life of usability testing. That's fascinating. Um, how did you get buy-in to build that lab in the organization? We had a great manager who. Uh, I'm not sure he ever got by in. That's why we were in the air conditioner closet. Uh, I think he, he, he was a corporate finagler. He could make things appear. He had friends all over the corporation and he would just call in favors and things would show up and we were never allowed to ask where it came from. <laughs> well, but at least you got the, the recorders and, and you were able to, to have some people there and record them. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was um it was a a uh, a great experience. Um uh sitting on the shoulders of of some really smart people uh sort of figuring this whole world out. Nobody everybody in the group except for me, I was uh, and one other person. Uh the two of us were software engineers. Everybody else was a clinical psychologist. A cognitive psychologist, actually, and uh, like you know, their last job was running rats through mazes, and I'm not kidding. And um, and so here we were trying to figure out how you get systems that people would just be able to use and not have to go through expensive training to get to. And even that idea that that's what we were trying to do, that took us a while to realize that that's what we were trying to do. How did you go about finding volunteers to, to come into this tiny room uh, with no air conditioning and, and with these loud cameras? <laughs> like, just... Well, initially, so the company I worked for, Digital Equipment Corporation, had 125,000 employees. So we initially, we would just find employees. And, and usually they were people around the business 
who did the things that we thought our customers did. Uh, eventually, we started going and meeting customers. But, you know, like the typing pool thing, you just hire a typist, right? So we did a lot of, you just you just hire temporary workers and you just bring them in. And that's, it didn't occur to us to do it any other way. And so, um, so a lot of it was, was just, um, uh, working with temp agencies and, and, you know, cause there were all these people who would do, you know, a day of work in this office and a day of work in that office and they just switch it up. So we would, for the most part, that's who we were looking for and that's who we got. That's so interesting. Um, so then a few years forward, I guess. Uh, there's the web revolution or the internet and people started having internet at home or internet, just one, but computers enable for, is for it going just online. I don't, I don't know. How, how many are there? Is, is, that was is, probably a valid question back in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you wrote, a, you wrote a book uh, called Website Usability. Um, what prompted you to, to write that book? Um. Uh, what prompted me to write the book, uh, was, so we, we had been, I mean, the, to be honest, I'm not really sure. We just wrote it. The, 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 um, the, uh, the, I think, I think what, what prompted, um, me to write the book, or, you know, I, I wrote it with four other people. So it was a team effort. Um, we had been doing research and we, and it basically was a report of the research we had done. Um, and we were the, f just by accident, I think we were the first people to, to conduct usability tests of people using websites with the express purpose of just learning how people used websites. That, that's, that's all we were interested in at the time. Uh, people had been doing focused usability testing on their own website, but we decided to just test a bunch of websites. And, and so we had to come up with this protocol to do that. We had, we had done this before, but not for websites. We had been doing this for a long time with PC software. So we would find people who needed to use spreadsheets and then we would test them on Lotus one, two, three and Excel and Borland and Quattro Pro and, and all the different spreadsheets that were on the market at the time to learn how to design better software. And we do the same thing with, with, um, uh, word processors and the same thing with, you know, data management tools. And, and, And so we were, we were doing these, these comparative usability tests and we've done them for a while. And so the web seemed like an, a, a nice next step. And so we didn't start out with the idea we'd write a book. We started out with the idea of we were going to learn a bunch of stuff and we did. And we ended up, uh, uh, I remember going to a conference, a human factors conference in, uh, Atlanta in 1996 and we had just finished the preliminary results of our studies and we'd come up with these findings about websites and this was not a conference on the web this was a conference on any type of of what we would now call ux uh for any type of device you know there were there were presentations about designing better airplane cockpits and nuclear power plants and and You know, the Media Lab was there talking about the future and Xerox Park was there talking about, uh, uh, you know, designing um, uh, large screen uh, interactive displays and all these other things. And we had this little session that I did. It was it was like it. It was it was a birds of a feather meeting. So it was one of these things where you signed up at the last minute to to do something. You pick a topic. There was no place for you to describe what the topic was. So you just named it. So we just called it website usability. And uh, and the only slot we could get was like 8.30 in the morning. And it was like in a room that sat 40 people. And um, 
by the time we started that eight o'clock, when we got there at like 7.45, the room was already filled. And by the time we started, it was not only filled, but the hallway was so packed that the hotel security had was getting really anxious that the fire marshal would come because so many people wanted to come to this session on website usability. And we... We had no idea that this would be interesting at this conference. We figured 10 people would show up who were like mildly interested and we'd have an interesting conversation. And we ended up presenting our results and 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 it was that I think that triggered us to write the book because um and uh, we created a series of workshops out of it and it just became this this bigger thing and it started speaking about it all over the world and audiences kept showing up because we were the only ones who'd ever actually looked at the patterns of what it's like for someone to use the web. And and most of the things that come today, things like navigation and how you use graphics and uh, how you fill out forms and, and how search works all sort of came out of that initial study. That's amazing. And um, was this before the dot-com crash? Oh, yeah. This was 1995, 1996. The dot-com crash was in 2000. So this was five years before. Do you think, um, since it was before, but just a few years before, was there already like a trend of people really interested in this new thing that was the internet or the internets? Yeah. So and... so the, the people who were most interested were these corporations who were being told they needed to have a website, but actually had no idea what that meant. And was it just a, another type of brochure or did it have to do something? And, and they, they, I mean, you're, uh, one of the sites that we were in, was in the initial study was the Disney website. And, uh, at the time Disney had no idea what they were doing on the web and, and you'd think they'd have their act together, but they really didn't. And it was basically, uh, it was so horrible to use. Um, uh, the, there was, I remember there was this, that while we were doing the study, there was this advertisement and it was an animated, I don't think it, I don't think it was implemented as an animated GIF because I don't think animated GIFs worked that way, but maybe they did. Maybe this was right around the time that you could have the first animated GIFs and, um, must've been how it, how it worked. And, um, uh, uh, it was this ponytailed redhead girl who would just lunge at the camera, right? It was, it was, a, it was a photo of this girl who was excited about something and she was just lunging at the camera repeatedly. And, uh, when you, on a, on a, um, uh, VGA resolution screen, which, you know, had, had, uh, what was VGA? It was, it was, uh, 640 by 480, right? So 480 lines, right? Um, uh, it, uh, this image would appear at the bottom of the window, and when you scrolled all the way on the on the Disney homepage, and when you scrolled all the way down to the bottom, it would work its way up to the top, but it would never go off the top. So you could not get rid of it. And we would ask people to to do things like try to find the cheapest hotel on the monorail at Walt Disney World. And they would start on this page and they would get completely um, uh, annoyed by this jumping girl who who would who would just not stop and there was no way to stop her and shut her off and i remember we saw more than one participant uh do things like take the the scroll bar and move it down to the bottom as fast as it can as as if by doing that, you were going to jettison this image off the top of the screen so that it would disappear and not bother you anymore. They would like slam the mouse down uh, uh, to try and get this thing to jump off the screen. And, and there were all these these images. I remember in that first report, we we 
our initial our initial finding, which we were completely wrong about at the time, was that graphics were just annoying. Uh, partially because of this jumping girl image, but because almost every website at the time had these gratuitous images that had no basis in what was there and just took up space. And because you had such a small screen, you had 640 by 480 to work with, these big images just made using the web that much more difficult. Nobody really knew how to balance the layout, how to make sure the graphics were relevant, any of those types of things. And what we learned in the process was, was that, no, there are some graphics that are incredibly useful. And we actually came up with an entire taxonomy at the time of what were useful graphics versus not useful graphics. But, but most of the graphics that were there in that taxonomy at that time were in the not useful category. They were just space-wasting, poorly executed images that took a long time to load and... Um, uh, and, you know, we didn't know anything about performance at the time. That wasn't anything we were talking about because everything was slow. We were, we were, we did our initial usability tests on uh, dial-up connections. So these were, these were very slow, slow, slow connections. So, so, you know, as far as we were concerned, images were just a waste. And, and that's what we wrote in the original report. Um that's amazing. Um, yeah, of course, it would take now. forever to load. And, mm. uh, yeah, yeah. And, and and the browsers at the time could do nothing else other than wait. you waited for it to load, right? It wouldn't load the text first and then the image. It would image, 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 image. Okay, there was no I async uh, loading, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were all, you know, back in those days, you know, we were running on PCs, the browsers, Netscape, um, I, uh, Explorer two or Explorer three, you know, these were, these were, um, browsers that, um, uh, were single threaded. They could only do one thing at a time. And there was no idea of a tab that, that did not exist. Yeah. Well, we've come a long way, uh, from those systems. Um, so continuing, so it was very interesting that, that you published your findings and that of course was very interesting because there was nothing else in the market uh, that you could like read in to, how, to learn how to design for the web. Um, so in the same spirit of sort of like, let's call it ed educating the, the industry, you, you've also found, you're the founder of Center Center. I'm a co-founder, yeah. You're the co-founder of Center Center. So how did you come um, about, you know, sort of like, or how, how did the idea occur to you to educate people on this, uh, on usability and, and how to design for technology? Um, the, uh, it, the way, you know, like everything, it's a long story. The, the, um, uh, it, it started with me whining, I think is the, 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 the fairest description. Um, uh, I was, um, at the, t uh, back in tw 2011 or so, yeah, it'd be about 2011, 2012. Um, uh, it was very clear at that point that UX was a thing that was here. It was a thing that was growing. We were seeing it was no longer in tech. It was now in every business. Um, it was no longer just about uh, uh, websites. You know, the iPhone had been out for several years and now you had apps and um, uh, designing apps. The iPad had just come out. Um, so there were devices and there were, uh, uh, there were all these things. And it was very clear that, that, that you could not have a business uh, that didn't have some sort of UX element to it. 
and you could see it getting picked up in different organizations. And the, all my clients were coming to me at the time saying, we can't hire enough UX people, right? We're having trouble finding them. We're having trouble getting the ones who are any good. We, you know, we, the schools uh, that were there, you, you, there weren't that, there weren't any schools that had a UX program at the time. They all had either visual design or interaction design or uh, information design, industrial design, uh, but they did not have a UX program per se. They would have courses that they would tack on to other programs. I mean, to this day, you still cannot get a degree in UX. You can, uh, because there's no accreditation for UX. Um, uh, so anything that claims that it's a UX certificate, it's actually built either on a MFA, a, a fine arts accreditation, or a um, industrial design accreditation or something else, um, cognitive psych. Uh, so the, um, but back then it was even worse and there weren't even certificate programs that you could get, um, or, you know, uh, minor degrees. And the, um, so the, the managers of all these UX efforts were, were really frustrated that they were having trouble just building their teams and really meeting the demand that the companies were putting on them. And so I was, I was whining about how they're just, you know, the schools need to get their act together and, and start producing more UX people because the demand is there and we're going to miss an opportunity in the world if we don't do this. And, and, uh, I was having dinner with a good friend and, and whining about this at dinner. And she said, well, Jared, you should start a school. And at the time, I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard, because what do I know about starting a school? Um, I didn't even go to school. So I, 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 you know, I don't know anything about starting a school. And, and um, the... Uh, and so I thought it was just a stupid idea. And we changed the conversation. We went on to do something else. I mean, she was like, no, you should do this. I'm like, no, this, 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 this seems very foolish. Somebody else should do this. And, but I could not shake the idea. For the life of me, I could not um, get rid of this idea that, that um, uh, maybe we should, to start a school and 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 so I I I did this thing that I often do when I have an idea that I'm not that I'm having trouble shaking, which is I go and I talk to my friends about it with the hopes that one of them will be a really good friend and just take me aside and say, you know, this is a really stupid idea. You should just drop this right now. This is not going to go anywhere. And what I realized was that I I actually don't have any good friends because because nobody did that everybody was like no you should do this you, this is this is absolutely what you should do and one of my friends uh said have you talked to leslie uh, leslie's my co-founder and and i knew her we had been on some projects together we'd worked on some education initiatives uh over the years but um uh but I didn't know her that well. And I said, no. He said, well, you should talk to Leslie because she's talking about this too. And I thought, oh, that's crazy. And I didn't do anything about it. But the very next day, Leslie tweeted that she was leaving her current job at the University of Tennessee where she was a professor. And she didn't know what her, um, uh, her next thing would be. But uh, she had great hopes that she was going to go off to do something amazing. And I sent her a DM and I said, I think we need to talk. And that afternoon we had a conversation and realized. Uh, so her thesis, she was getting her, her, uh, her PhD in education, what's known as an EDD. And, and uh, uh, she, her thesis for her doctorate was um, how to build a school that taught 
UX design. And uh, I started sharing the notes that I'd had on what I thought a school might look like because I'd been working on it in my head for a while. And it matched up 100% with her thesis. And it was like, holy shit, we, we, we both figured out this thing at the same time. And so we, we just started working on it together and, and we've been working together on it ever since. And, um, uh, we've had students, we've graduated them. It's currently, we, we had just graduated a group of students right before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic hit, we were about to start up a new group and we're like, you know what, we should wait. This will be over soon. Of course, it's not over yet. So we're still waiting, uh, because the program the, the, the success of the program has to do with bringing the students to Chattanooga um, and having them work in a studio for um, uh, for 96 weeks. And they take classes in the studio and they and the classes and the studio work blend together and they learn as they're doing. And it's very much experiential learning. And we didn't know how to make that happen online um, because they learn as a team. There are team members who are what we call facilitators, who are the faculty members who, who, who basically are act as sort of project leaders and coaches and training and, and um, uh, mentors and in some cases therapists. Uh, uh, who basically help them grow their career and help them learn things and students learn at their own pace. And we, we just, it was hard enough to make it a, a live program that we just like, we weren't ready to make it a, a remote program. We didn't understand, we still don't understand it enough to know how to, how to really make it as good as it has been with everybody remote where you can't, you can't, I mean, you can't be on, zoom for eight hours a day particularly in different time zones and but in the program you're there for eight hours a day you're working it's a it's a real job you're working on real work it's you get real projects from the very first week um you're working on real projects so supplied by companies that uh, are watching your work so that you they can see you grow and see the experience you bring and you're taking courses, which basically tell you how to do the things in your project, and uh, you apply it immediately. And we di we didn't know how to replicate that online, so we just like, we'll wait. So that's what we're doing. We're waiting. Hopefully, this fall or or next spring, we can uh, it can be safe enough that we can bring people to Chattanooga and and start up another cohort or two for next year. Yeah, that would be great. We're all waiting for this to pass. Um, so you've been in the in the field of usability for a long time, obviously. Um, have you spotted any trends like looking forward? Like what do you think the industry is lacking right now? Or what do you think is going to be the next sort of educational gap for designers or for people in the tech industry in general? Um, well, first, I, I'm not sold on the idea that there's an industry. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what we have is a collection of really useful skills. Uh, and, um, and I think that anybody can have these skills and to some extent, anybody does. Right. Everybody does. Right. I'm, I'm a. I'm a real believer in the idea that everybody is really a designer. Um, uh, it's just that some are better than others. And and everyone can become a better designer. So for me, what I'm interested in is this idea of how do we make everybody a better designer? Right. There is no math industry, but everybody who works in business has to know math. And there is no writing industry per se. I mean, there are professional writers, but that's a very small industry. Most of the people who write are writing emails. And 
Uh, there is no email writing industry, but everybody has to know how to be able to communicate through writing. And um, so there is no real UX design industry, but everybody needs to know how to, how, to, how to do UX design because every decision that gets made in an organization inevitably affects the experience that users have, right? The, the, certainly, the, the, you've got software developers who are laying out a database and, and, and populating it with data, and the decisions they make on what are the primary keys and the relationships in the fields and the, what is efficient and what is not efficient will inevitably dictate what we can easily do or not easily do with that data in the future. So they're making UX decisions. And there are other engineers who worry about how fast things move on and off servers. And decisions they make will inevitably affect the performance of, you know, streaming video or data retrieval or whatever it is. And again, that affects the user's experience. And of course, the product people are deciding what features get put into the product and which ones don't, and how many features get added over time and where they get added, and, and that affects the user experience. And, and um, uh, the support people are part of the experience. Many of them are now being no longer called support. They're called customer success because it's clear that they are key to the success of customers. So, so they're part of the user's experience and the, uh, the training that people get is part of the user's experience and the sales side is part of the user's experience and the marketing side is part of the user's experience. All those people are making decisions every day that affect the experience that people have. And uh, uh, and then that means that, that, that finance, who's deciding which group gets budget, how many developers do we hire versus how many people who have research skills versus how many people have design skills, that those decisions are made, uh, they affect the user's experience. We know that for a fact. If we have more designers, we'll have a better experience. And if we have less, des fewer designers. So, so... So that affects the experience. And then um, uh, HR expects it. So there isn't anything that happens in the organization that doesn't affect the experience, except none of these people know that they're making UX decisions. And they don't have the benefit of people who know what UX decisions are to, for instance, do user research and find out, is this the right decision to make here? And so I think this is what we need to be working on. Right. This this idea that um, uh, uh, that that there's a, um, a a this is not an industry. Uh, Leah Bewley has a great quote, which is um, something to the effect of of. Uh, Great designers are not people who produce designs. Great designers are people who facilitate designing, right? What, you know, what the professionals in our business need to be doing is facilitating design all over their organizations and making it happen, making all of those people who are making design decisions be the best designers they can be. And... Everyone can be a better designer, so let's let's figure out how to do that. Let's figure out how we institutionalize that. Let's figure out how we grow that. So that, to me, is where where we need to be going, because this idea that there's a group on the third floor in a set of cubes that they've decorated differently than everybody else, uh, with you know crap all over post its and other crap all over their walls. Uh, uh, they're the design team, and that's where design happens. And on every other floor of the tower, there's no design. Um, that 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 ship has sailed. That's not happening. Yes, it's more about the design awareness in the organization. Oh, it's more than awareness. It's literacy and fluency. It's it's knowing that. Um, it's one thing to know that there is a thing called design. It's another thing to realize that you do it and you're not good at it and you need to get better at it. You know, it's like writing. 
right? You know, your boss comes to you and say, you've sent me five emails today and I didn't understand a single one of them. You're not long for this job, right? When does it get to the point where that's designed to? Yeah, that's, that's super, super interesting. Um, Jared, thank you so much for your time today. Um, pretty sure there's a lot we didn't cover. Um, maybe in the future, we're going to have the opportunity to chat again. Um, sure. Again, thank you for coming on the podcast and um, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this was a lot of fun. And tell your, your viewers to, to come join our Leaders of Awesomeness community. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, it's on your it's on the website of UIA Center Center. You just type that on Google, and you can find a link there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's leaders.centercenter.com is the easiest way to find it. Um, there you go. And then Jared is on Twitter, and he's always having really interesting discussions there. I know because I because I've seen them myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to follow him uh, on Twitter, I think it's JM Spool, right? Yes. Somebody said the other day that, that um, uh, what did they say? It was very funny. Uh, 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 they said, they said Matt, I was the master of rage and in entertainment on design Twitter. So. <laughs> yeah. You could pin it to your. To your yes. Yes. That's it's uh, 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 that is a, a, a very funny um, uh, title master of rage entertainment. <laughs> there you have it folks. So follow the master of rage and entertainment in design and, um, yeah. See you soon. Thank you.